Welcome to the One Within All Back to Innerverse. This recording is coming to you from July 31st, 2020, which has for many of us been the weirdest year of our lives. <laughs> when it comes to the events and themes of this particular annual cycle, I'm sure many of us have wondered what the sky clock, aka the Astro Logos, has got to say about what humanity has been experiencing and what may be to come. While most professional astrologers I know don't like to make explicit predictions, hindsight is 2020, as they say, and because the stuff that's been going on the last several, mo several months has been so extreme, I think it's not too soon to start looking back on our recent past and comparing the various trends to the zodiacal zenith planetary patterns and crazy conjunctions. And since I'm more of a generalist with interest in astrology and not an expert myself, I thought it would be best to bring back one of our most experienced astrologers out there for an analytic recap and a projection of what may possibly be coming next. Our guest this time around is Athen Kaminti, a teacher of sidereal astrology who you can find at Mastering the Zodiac MasteringTheZodiac.com, where he's created several resources and tools for learning the ropes of your horoscopes, and you can start by casting your own sidereal chart at his site. Last year, when I first spoke with Athen, we talked about the differences between mainstream Western astrology, which is known as the tropical system, and the sidereal system that Athen utilizes. And to sum it up in short, tropical or Western systems organize the 12 zodiac signs into equally measured sections that are static from year to year, while sidereal astrology looks at the constellation's apparent size in the sky, meaning they aren't all equal in measure. Sidereal also takes into account the slow backwards procession of the zodiac over time, which eventually shifts the sign observed behind the sun on a given day in the calendar year at a rate of roughly one degree every 72 years or something like that. Athens system also incorporates a 13th sign, the serpent Ophiuchus. So it's been an interesting time. It's an interesting system for sure. And if it resonates with you, definitely check out more of Athens work on his website and YouTube channel, which I'll link in the show notes. And I'll admit, I see the value in both ways of looking at the Zodiac. And I won't tell you one is superior to the other. The value really depends on how you feel our connection to the stars might work. The tropical system is a great metaphorical story for the flow of seasons and contains many hidden nuggets of wisdom pertaining to natural law for those with eyes to find them. So if those stories are created by man and simply encoded to the stars as a reference for remembering them, then in that sense, their little literal position doesn't matter as much. But if there's a real effect in an as above, so below alchemical way of the stars on the earth and humanity, as one might very well infer from things like ancient people building temples and structures designed to capture the light from specific stars on certain dates, then the sidereal reframing of our understanding of the zodiac would be highly relevant. So in the end, I think it's up to you to decide what resonates more or to consider the merits of both systems individually as I try to do. But regardless, I am super grateful the stars have aligned to bring us this conversation and I'm excited to dig in and demystify 2020 with the professor of astral physics and etheric cosmical currents of our reality construct, the awesome Athen Kaminti. Thanks for being here, dude, and welcome back to Interverse. Thanks, Chance. Good to be back. Yeah, so I really wanted to have this conversation with you uh, about this crazy year, man. Um, I'm definitely open to you starting things off however you want. If you want to give people another introduction uh, in your own way to what you do and your website and how people can uh, learn from you, that would be fine before we maybe kick into gear on looking at the 2020 sky clock. And man, what a weird set of events we've seen. Seriously. And yeah, I don't think anyone truly predicted something like to this extent. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you can check it out. MasteringTheZodiac.com. That's where all the material is. Uh, YouTube channel uh, where we post uh, weekly videos there for those of you into staying up to date in terms of what's going on astrologically and what kind of influence that might have uh, for each of our lives in the world. Also, there are some informative videos on astrology in general and how it works and things like this. Um, the number one thing I do recommend if you are new to this uh, form of astrology, which most of us are, is to go to the website and check out your dates uh, when you were born, right? Your sun sign dates. And uh, you might be surprised because your sign is likely changed. And I do feel like you'll probably resonate quite strongly with the new sign. Um, and then if you want to go one step further, you can check out the birth chart calculator that's on there if you want to see the whole chart and where your other planets are placed. And then from that, there's also courses and readings for those of you who want to get into that, some astrology software, 
Um, but I think a great place to start with the weeklies and also with the um, dates and the birth chart calculator. Absolutely. And, you know, I think we covered this a lot in the first episode that we did together. So people should go check that out. But the the shift that we're talking about is it isn't super major for every planet. Um, and even with the sun sign, just because it might shift a sign over, I, I kind of look at the zodiac as a spectrum, right? So you're not super far away with tropical from where you are in in um, sidereal. <clears throat> and anyway, I I really like the 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 differences for their own merits, and it's I, I like what you do especially because you you obviously put so much hustle and work into the uh, the forecasts and the horoscopes that you do for YouTube and. I'm sure you've worked with a lot of people one on one. So it's cool to have such a a good teacher here to resonate with. And I don't know, man, do you want to look at some? Uh, I, I kind of want to kick it over to you and let you decide what things were most important um, in retrospect about the, you know, the year that we've been experiencing. Yeah, so <clears throat> we did see astrologically, like most astrologers, um, did see that there would be what I, what I call a restructuring um, taking place this year. And that's because right at the beginning of the year, between the months of January and February, um, we had Saturn, the planet of structures and systems and governments and foundations of life next to the planet of Pluto, which those of you who know is about transformation and change. And when you read them together, it's this kind of restructuring thing. So we definitely saw there was going to be this and we've looked at patterns in the past, um, which, you know, when this conjunction has happened, there was this kind of changing energy to the systems and structures, both economically, which we definitely saw play out this year. And then also in terms of um, just government operation and things. What we didn't see was the medical side of it. Although I'm sure some did, I don't know if they were even astrologers. I heard somewhere that someone actually did predict that there would be like um, a type of pandemic this year. But I mean, that could have just been the fact that so many people are online predicting things and this person just happened to be right about it. But astrologically, there wasn't anything really pointing towards that. What we did see though, was the restructuring for sure. Um, and in the difference between the system I use and in the tropical system is that with the system I use, the conjunction is in Sagittarius was and, and the influence is still there and Sagittarius has a lot to do with the perception of things it's our beliefs it's our philosophies it's our outlook on life so that's the context in which things are restructuring and that has definitely played out in the sense that if there's ever been a year that i've lived through personally in in the sense that a perception about something has changed or a perception about life or the future has changed it's definitely been this year at least as far back as i can remember uh, even 9-11 didn't have that large of an influence on me in terms of what is the future going to be like and just really shifting the perception of life. So that's that was, you know, uh, again, hindsight that was uh, foretold or that it would be that. How it's played out is some people say, well, maybe, you know, the COVID thing and we can get into some of the conspiracies and all this about it. And maybe this is, you know, mostly about governments and systems um, using the perception of the masses and changing, again, restructuring the perception of the masses. Um, and that the COVID thing was just a kind of catalyst or something to use in order to make that happen. Um, but uh, whatever it is, definitely we can see the restructuring of perception. What's coming up at the end of the year will be the more medical side of it from the astrology. And that's the Ephucus that you were talking about, Chance. We're going to have a total solar eclipse in that constellation. And so we'll probably see some new beginnings come out from the medical side of things, um, which we'll see. It could be something like, you know, new medical reform, new medical legislation, maybe some vaccine, something or other, something like that. And then we also see around that same time, the Grand Conjunction which is Saturn and Jupiter getting close to each other. And this is usually symbolic of when this happens of some sort of new system and structure um, coming into fruition. So again, possible new legislation. There's also an election in the United States around that time, uh, which could also symbolize some new um, you know, government influence coming and going into next year. So those, that's what we know 
in terms of that interpretation coming up based on kind of where we're at now in the yearly sense, sidereally speaking, with the system I'm using. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff to look at there. I mean, the position of Saturn this year, I've felt it more than most because I'm 31. So we're in the sort of natal zone for my Saturn, right? And have been for a little while, but uh, <laughs> I've been super interested in uncovering the secrets of Saturn, if you will. <laughs> and what I wanted to point out, though, about the the people that might have predicted that we'd have a pandemic this year. One of the interesting things I've heard, and I'm not sure what you might know about this, but is related to the sun and solar minimums. And what we've been in for a while, quite a while, is a solar minimum, like an extreme one. And there are some researchers that have charted the sunspot cycles that uh, we have records of and been able to line them up and show that in solar minimums, there are more out, like mass disease outbreaks, which I find very interesting because especially if you are inclined to look at health and disease as being something highly connected to our electromagnetic biofield energy health, if you will, as I tend to look at it more than the sort of allopathic Western medicine view of in infectious vectors and things like that. Uh, really interesting supporting evidence to to suggest that that's a reality because the solar minimums do seem to correspond with stuff like big uh, disease outbreaks. And I wondered if you had any thoughts upon the role of the sun in all of what we've been experiencing this year on from any from any um, standpoint, be it the fact that it, that it's dimmer than normal because of uh, stuff being sprayed in the sky or, you know, any other any other insights you have about the the sun and how it relates to where we're at currently? Yeah, actually, you know, I probably should look more into the sun. I mean, astrologically, we're really just, you know, with astrology concerned about what's the constellation or the planet that is next to or behind the sun. So normally, astrologically, we don't get too much into things like the solar minimums, the density, the solar flares, things of this nature. Um, but we probably should. Um, and I, that's very interesting. I did not know that about that correlation, that pattern. Because uh, that's really what we're doing with astrology is we're just seeing patterns, right? And uh, if we do look at something like the sun's patterns, both in terms of its illumination and solar flares or whatever, um, that can help us foretell, you know, see what might be a potential into the future. Yeah. And I think that um, it's very interesting fact. So there was actually... The other was does it correlate the other way like what could you do you know if you could look back at when there was disease outbreaks was there a solar minimum during those times like say during you know the um you know i don't know um some of the other flu pandemics or something that we had or does it work just uh, from the sun no that is yeah that's actually what i'm saying is that what i've been looking at a little bit i mean not deeply researching but seeing some other researchers that have gone deep on this and shared that this is what seems like might be going on is that yeah the solar minimum is what like the the decrease in sunspot activity is what is actually correlated to the outbreak of disease and health problems and it's interesting because it could be like the electromagnetic energy coming from the sun which is like the heart of the whole system it's the generator if you will that that being weaker in some sense could be why our biology gets weaker. Our biofields get a little more vulnerable to different things that can throw us off. And another another interesting part of evidence in this camp, it's not exactly related to the sun, but there's another book called the, I'll have to link the first book that's talking about the sunspots that I can't remember off the top of my head, but uh, I'll make a note to link that. The other book that I checked out and I haven't read all of, but have investigated a bit, so many books on my list, <laughs> is The Invisible Rainbow. And this is one that shows a potential connection between new electronic technology and uh, different recent history disease outbreaks. And that's an interesting book as well. It connects like the in installation of radio towers and um, the proliferation of radio signals all across the planet with Spanish flu. And there was something that was an outbreak that seemed to correlate with when the telegraph wires were put up everywhere. And, you know, 
we've seen all kinds of just total crashing of people's immunity and autoimmune disorders in recent recent years. And we've been massively ratcheting up the EMF smog, if you will, with smartphones and with Wi-Fi and things like that. And this isn't to be like, oh, fear, be scared of the signals or whatever. It's just to point out that like if if your personal energy and your health is not up to snuff and it's something you should always be concerned with improving no matter the climate you're in, if you don't have a strong biofield, you just are more vulnerable to outside influences in general. And so it makes sense that EMF could throw you off. And I think that our biology probably adapts to it really quickly too. And that's why you see maybe the correlation right when the new technology hits, but then uh, it sort of tapers off as far as people having problems from it, almost like a survival of the fittest thing. But I, I don't know. It's it's interesting. It's an interesting concept. I really like the idea that we're electric beings in an electric universe. And that's sort of the perspective that all this comes from and might even explain some of the uh, reason why we can find these links between the astrology and the uh, the human. Yeah. And you didn't mention 5G, but was that implicit because of the whole rolling out of 5G? Because a lot of people were also making the claim that some of the more 5G saturated areas were also the ones with the most um, spread of the virus. Don't quote me on that. Obviously, I'm not the professional to talk to you about that. But was that implicit in, in your statement there about the 5G? Because obviously that's been rolling out. And now we have this thing going on. Yeah, I left. I leave that up to people to decide for themselves. I'm not going to be able to tell you if I'm if that's true or not. And I don't want to scare people and be like, "Oh, 5G is going to be the the murder apocalypse on Earth." But because uh, I don't really think it will be. But I do think what's interesting is the power of our minds. And if that information gets out there and people start kind of making themselves sicker just by believing that they're doomed. I mean, that definitely profits the people that uh, sell you the pills and the treatments, right? So I, I can't say for sure that that's a connection, but it, I do say, I, I guess it is implied though. I mean, if that book, The Invisible Rainbow is onto something with EMF pollution and uh, people getting sick, then 5G, it's definitely a more extreme frequency. I know that for sure than the other ones we've been using for our wireless systems. So it, it could be, but at the end of the day, it's always going to be like your own personal health and vitality that dictates whether or not something's going to wreck you. So it's not something yeah. to be scared of, but it's something to consider because like, you know, we're barreling forward in in the recent years with this technology without without any case studies on on how long term effects are going to play out for people for sure. Right. Yeah, I was curious about that because of the EMF thing with with the 5G and people talking about it. And it is good to kind of prepare, you know, I mean, um, set yourself up in a situation where maybe you're not as exposed to these completely new technologies that we know nothing about. You know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, getting some time either out in nature or away from the busy life or just simply turning off your cell phone before you go to bed. Like these kinds of little things, you know, could end up having a large impact, I think, on our overall well-being for sure. Yeah. There's ways to mitigate too. Like my friend, Matt Landman has a company called Spiro Protection Clothing. This is a silver threaded hat, protects mm -hmm. your dome, just like uh, oh, nice. the, the lead bib would protect you from x-rays. And that's cool. I'm My feet are on a grounding mat right now that plugs into the ground port wall socket of my house. So even though I'm in front of this big computer battle station, I'm grounding. So I think really my I've been researching the biofield a lot. And I think that if you can ground, that's the most important thing regularly, because uh, I believe how I understand these frequencies to affect you is almost like on the energetic level, fraying at the edge of your aura and like tattering your aura, metaphorically speaking, and grounding is sort of what repairs it. And I think that a daily practice of it can reverse what you're what damage you might be taking from the EMF, whereas never gr getting grounded, walking around with your rubber soled shoes all the time and completely being disconnected from the earth uh, is what causes maybe like a buildup of damage over time. But I'm no, I'm no uh, health professional. So don't listen to me. <laughs> yeah, me neither, actually. <laughs> We're just rambling, I guess. But it's, it's really interesting stuff. I think we should all be thinking about, but let's talk about eclipses real quick. Um, I want to know your take about the moon's role in the eclipse. Uh, our mutual acquaintance, Crow777, has made the statement that the moon doesn't really show up 
on the day of solar eclipses and that you can't measure it or find it. And that in some like Vedic traditions, they say it's the nodes that are covering the sun during the eclipses. Do you have any thoughts on, on that in particular? Um, I, there's just no way to, to really measure it because I mean, if whether it's there or not, I mean, if there's no light penetrating, then you're just not going to see it. So I usually just keep it simple and just focus on what I see in the sky going on. Obviously during eclipse times, it's, you can just feel the energy. That's a very energetically, maybe even like Newtonian energetically, like we're talking about with the sun's energy and all this, like it's a very uh, either physically or even spiritually or both energetic time of, you know, kind of resetting and grounding and just kind of starting fresh, which is what I think fundamentally the eclipse is, whether it's Rahu and Ketu as something outside of the sun and moon or whether the moon is completely visible or whether I like to just stick with what is the time period about and, you know, what, what, what is it really signaling? What, what are we feeling is best to do during those certain times? And that's what we see with a lot of like civilizations is they always did ceremonies during the eclipses. They always considered them very spiritually important times. Some like the minds that make sacrifices during that time to the gods. This has this very strong symbolic, um, you know, meaning. And um, yeah, and I think that's the most important thing to take away from those eclipses. I can't speak too much in terms of measuring it. Crow would be the one to talk to or, you know, his, his viewers because they're out there with actual telescopes looking at these things. And um, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I think that'd be a good place to check out. But I have no input on specifically what could be going on there other than we're just not seeing anything. And it is an actual dimming of light to the extent that you aren't seeing the moon. Yeah, for sure. I don't have a position on it either, but I do like... I really like when people question things that we're taking for granted that we haven't been able to ourselves prove one way or the other. And we just take, you know, the word of the experts for it. And with with things in the sky and in space, that's definitely something that most people are doing is either taking experts word for it or their conceptualization of what it's like is based mostly on Hollywood and fiction. And uh, we we have to get real about some of those things for sure. But let, what about the eclipse this year? Um, what part of the world is it occurring in? You said it's going to be in Ophiuchus. Can you, can you give us a little more about what that symbolizes? Yeah, so Ophiuchus is the serpent bear. So that's the 13th sign that was uh, removed from their traditional astrology. Uh, it was basically lumped in with Scorpio. Um, and it is very similar energy to Scorpio because it does share the same part of the sky, but it's missing the other half of it because, um, you know, Scorpio is about depth and bringing things to the surface, excavating things. But Ophiuchus is taking it one step further and actually healing those deeper things that we bring to the, sur uh, to the surface. And so the actual constellation is a serpent bearer, which is a person wielding a serpent or holding a serpent. And that's always been very symbolic in ancient times of healing and medicine and kind of working with the more physical realms, which the serpent represents both physically in terms of physical healing, but also spiritually, like working with the ego, like through psychology and shadow work and all these kinds of things. And so that's where the eclipse will be. Um, so, you know, this does have, it is somewhat of a cyclical thing. So it depending on how you measure it, it happens roughly every, uh, would it be 19 ish years, but sometimes it'll skip it. So it could be up to like every once every 40 years. So it's not that significant of a thing, but I think definitely in the context of what we've seen this year in that there's likely some, there's a symbolic reference to that serpent energy, again, the medical energy. That is something new is arising, certainly out of probably the COVID situation. Um, so eclipse, eclipses, in this case, the solar eclipse represents new beginnings. It represents the ending of the previous eclipse cycle, which is the past year or six months, and starts a fresh new one. Now, the eclipses are always involving one of the two nodes. So you have the north node, the south node, the Rahu and Ketu that you were talking about. And the North node is our future Dharma. The South node is the past karma. 
energy that we're resolving. That tends to be the more spiritual one. And that's where it's, that's what it's going to be. So it's going to be a South node, uh, total solar eclipse. And that's another thing that makes it significant. Total solar eclipse in a fucus, which is symbolizing a new beginning coming out of the, the healing archetype constellation that will require releasing something, some old paradigm, some old perspective, um, and then starting a new one in, in its place. That's what we can gather from that in and of itself. Now, obviously, you could cast a chart for it, get a little bit more information, but that's the most important fundamental about this eclipse, which again, mainstream, you'll never hear this in the mainstream astrology because they're not using the actual constellation. So they're going to tell you that the, um, the eclipse is in Sagittarius, uh, but actually it's in this healing uh, archetype constellation, which is very important. And to put it into context too, uh, for those of you who know, so a fucus is where the galactic center is. So the center of the galaxy. And so, you know, that's that massive like black hole drawing in all this energy, all this light that every once in a while, which we'll never see in our lifetime, but we'll do a gamma ray burst and release all that energy all at once. And this is very symbolic for transformation, especially with the South node. It's like releasing, letting go, and in the process, a rebirth, a death. You could, it's, you know, it's the part of the sky deals with death. So it's a death and the rebirth kind of energy. And so very powerful, very symbolic, very spiritual um, in that sense. So when I say releasing, I don't mean being passive or just letting go of the ego completely. What I mean is really being releasing in the context of the universal flow of things, like being more receptive, listening, taking time out, meditating, releasing the physical attachments so that we can really listen to what's really going on and what's important on the soul and spiritual level. That would be the healthy way of expressing it. What the elites or those who are probably also using true sidereal probably using it as is as a, probably an opportunity to bring in some sort of new, what I'm thinking is medical system, <clears throat> medical structure with the Saturn we were talking about, you know, something like that probably emerging from it is be my guess. But again, the spiritual that's important. It does feel like that, like the um, the move of the, and I always like to call the elites, the Elites, which actually pertains to Saturn, L being an old name for Saturn. <laughs> and Saturn being the one that's like the symbolic of rulership and order and government and that, those type of things. Um, not that Saturn is itself evil. Uh, it's just symbolically representing these aspects of humanity and consciousness but uh the elites <laughs> if you will seem to be trying to push towards an a resolution of this eclipse energy or this this year's patterning uh as being basically a new medical government in a sense that com combining what i consider to be a religion which is the western allopathic medical model combining that religion with the state and maybe even on a global scale. And I mean, hopefully this isn't stuff that happens, but there are powers that be that are, want to create a, a system where you have to have vaccinations or some kind of immunity passport just to travel from place to place. Saturn controls borders and and the, uh, the con it containers, literally the concept of containers and limitation. So... The fact that it, we can't even necessarily travel out of our own countries right now me, shows that there's definitely something really important and big going on with Saturn at the time at this time. And uh, whether that's Saturn and Sagittarius or Saturn and Capricorn, kind of like I said earlier, it's a spectrum. Um, the Zodiac is and there's something to maybe infer from either of those things. But definitely the Jupiter Saturn connection going on this year is like in a way, the opposition between limitation and expansion. And what well, we're seeing that right now, because so many of us were like, so many of us were set on this expansion path, uh, being really empowered by the technology of our current time and new businesses everywhere, the music industry really expanding, not the industry itself, but like independent artists were, I don't think any time in history has, have independent artists had it better than they had it at like, 2019 in that summer things were just really blowing up at least in, in the country i'm in the part of the world i'm in it seemed more possible than ever to do those things and then uh this medical martial law drops and people 
are losing everything that are those type of independent creators and artists. They don't. Uh, luckily, I have the Internet as my as my uh, platform, so I'm not affected in the same way. But like if you traveled to events and you sold your art at events and music festivals or you're a musician that played live shows to make money, that stuff is currently gone. And so there's definitely been like a limitation brought to people's expansion this year, this Saturn Jupiter thing. Um, I, it's really, it's really interesting. I think the paradigm that is shifting is going to be one of two things. It's our choice. Either Ophiuchus is here to, to change the paradigm of the Western medical model and people's belief in it to something more natural, essentially something, uh, more related, holistic and related to nature and ancient wisdom and, and spagyria or spagyrics, the alchemy of plant medicines, things like that, or the restructuring of the paradigm is going to go straight into the uh, <laughs> the full medical lockdown, medical government merger of re- the medical religion with the uh, the state, and that that's not a fun looking outlook for uh, for humanity in my opinion i don't think that that's the way we want to go i think that's going to be what causes a lot of division but the other way is going to be if more, enough people wake up to resist that then what could emerge out of it is uh the next phase of our expansion with with healthy limitations in place instead of uh, these constricting and sort of the death half of the wave type of restrictions that's interesting because this half of the zodiac, the dark, the dark side, if you will, after, I mean, in tropical, it starts in Libra. I guess I'm not sure where the equinox sits in sidereal, but this uh, part of the, the year where the sun is, le- there's less daylight, less daylight, less daylight till the solstice and it starts going the other direction. It's always been about the purification of our energy in that time. Uh, if we're going to like, you know, discipline and Saturn, those things go hand in hand. It, what matters in the winter in a literal sense in nature is like, how well did you prepare for the winter? What did you have stored away? How much work did you uh, set yourself up with in the part of the year where things were bountiful? And he, the disciplinarian either like kills your ass whenever you don't have that that stuff ready to go or you are rewarded for that. And winter makes you stronger and you come through the other side with a brand new appreciation of the springtime and uh, ready to go into the next phase of your cycle. And so it's interesting too the 19 year cycle thing you brought up because this is COVID-19, uh, 19 years ago was 9-11. In a lot of ways, the type of legislation and changes being made to our systems reflect 9-11, but in like a slow motion way. That's why I hear people call this uh, event 9-11 in slow motion. <laughs> and yeah, the moon is in a 19 year cycle, if I'm not mistaken, it returns sort of to its position. It was in 19 years prior. Even the guy Fauci had the the Dr. Fauci guy was bold enough to go throw out the opening pitch at a baseball game wearing a jersey with 19 as his number. <laughs> so I think that the powers that be are definitely aware of all this, like you said, and, and probably using sidereal very possibly. And they have. Uh, they have an awareness of these cycles and and mo- big moves are planned in conjunction with these to try to capitalize on the the energy shifts that are that are present if i'm not wrong about that yeah i i believe so i don't see why they wouldn't you know being masons just from what we know publicly like obviously they're into astrology and why would they be using the uh, seasonal astrology when before uh you know before the roman empire uh, we were using true sidereal um, more fastly than the simplified system. So, uh, yeah, no doubt. And and I really like what you said, too, about that Saturn-Jupiter conjunction, because it works both ways. Like, so Saturn's going to help refine and ground the Jupiterian energy. And that's really what we want to focus on. Like, personally, that's what I'm saying, like, about the eclipse. Like, it's good to be aware and informed of what's going on in the world. But at the same time, like, write your own narrative. Like this year with all this Sagittarius energy is about writing your own narrative. What is it you perceive? What is it you want to build towards, you know, for your future and sharing your knowledge and wisdom with others and like getting this information out there, whatever your perspective is. That's the theme. That's what's most important spiritually on the collective front, the elites or whatever. There might be this thing where it's controlling all that, limiting that. Right. 
but we want to use this time to limit ourselves. Well, once the grant conjunction happens, so um, in the November time, start to limit ourselves and see what can we, you know, see in terms of a long-term vision, something that's a potential, some opportunity, something that inspires us that we can build towards our long-term. That would be the personal way of using the Saturn Jupiter. And then the other way around, how can we, you know, maybe consider um, building some new foundations in our own life, in our personal life, right? These are the opportune times to do that. And that's what I really like to focus on with the astrology is, you know, how to see it from our own perspective, right? From your life or what we might call it from your birth chart or from your perspective. And what are you gathering from these certain times? Thinking for yourself would be one way of saying it, but it's like perceiving for yourself as well. Because so much of life and the outcomes of life are based on how we perceive things and what our belief systems are, what our beliefs are. And if we and if we believe that there's this, let's say, virus that's killing off all these people and whatever, our decision making and and our hopes and our potentials and all that get highly influenced by that. Um, so paying attention, yeah. Saturn, stay grounded, pay attention to facts, obviously, but look at them for how they are. And at the same time, be mindful of how you're perceiving things uh, within the context of the reality, right? That's Saturn, Jupiter, Saturn's contraction, Jupiter's expansion, continue to expand, see potentials, but stay grounded in the reality and the facts of things. I think that's what's really most important about the end of this year going into next year, as well as the eclipse of listening, like I was saying, and, you know, checking in with your spiritual self to see what arises from that and what could end up being something that's very personally healing for you. It doesn't mean physical healing. It could be spiritual. Some of us might, you know, face some wounds, face some fears. And it can be a super empowering and super transformative time going into the new year, you know, for these, what it was basically a series of new beginnings. When we talk about conjunctions in astrology, even the eclipse, it's a solar eclipse, it's a conjunction. This is all pointing towards new beginnings. And I think it's really the question of where do you, you know, what kind of new beginnings do you want to set? Um, for you or for the world where you're going to contribute? What are you going to actually do with your power as a person instead of giving your power away, recognizing you have the power, especially when you're attuned to the flow of life and these certain events that, again, astrology, but just getting out into nature can help us reconnect with, you know. Uh, that goes right back to the grounding thing. Nature is the thing that will ground you. <laughs> so right. very, very important. And I love the dichotomy between contraction and expansion in the Jupiter Saturn uh, dynamic because it really explains you're talking about grounding that expansive energy in reality. It really explains like why I consider conspiracy research and being willing to look at the dark side of things and talk about them without fear to be exactly what that is, the grounding aspect of stuff. I mean, some people will call you negative whenever you're being realistic. <laughs> and that's something that is part of, I believe, the uh, the move that they're trying to put humanity into. The The transhuman thing is about creating a one-dimensional person that's just a, a stimulus response machine. And their negativity, if you will, their realism doesn't come into play. And I, I really think like even when it comes to what they what people will say about like a female's cycle, their monthly cycle and how at a point in that cycle, they're more negative. Well, I think that's just reflecting the nature of, of consciousness and that in its proper expression, that isn't negativity. It is grounded realism. And you sometimes you need to look at things from that lens. Sometimes you need to look at things through the infinite potential lens, which is the Jupiterian love side. And it's, it's healthy. It's healthy to have both. I don't talk about conspiratorial things to scare people. And I don't try to, I try not to only talk about that and also talk about solutions and, and the infinite potentials that we've got. And I don't think looking at what is actually happening and what might happen is necessarily locking it in as like your quantum mechanics, choose your own reality thing. I, I believe that it's more complicated than that. And your actions and your words are more relevant than your speculations in terms of like the direction that your personal universe is going to go into. So I love that dynamic. I think it's really cool. Another thing that's been, I, in my opinion, a big part of 2020 is the retrograde action. Uh, for example, Pluto retrograde. I've seen so many 
skeletons coming out of the closet from people that you never would have expected. Like to go back to the artist uh, scene, the alternative and counterculture arts that I'm into, lots of uh, music producers getting put on blast for, you know, getting destroyed by cancel culture because so many people came out of the woodworks and said they were predatory towards them and have proof and have screenshots and, and whatever. So what are your, what are your thoughts on the retrogrades Pluto, for example, and, and other ones that we've been experiencing this year? Have you seen any interesting parallels in the reality to the retrogrades? Yeah, lots. Um, so one is that all the retrogrades are very much staggered which um, doesn't happen that often. So, so for example, you know, these outer planets, they'll all go retrograde once a year. Um, and even, you know, Venus, for example, she'll go retrograde for about once a year. Mercury will go retrograde three times a year. So retrogrades are all in all a very common thing. Uh, but in the way that they unfolded this year was very in interesting because they were staggered. It was like, <clears throat> when one planet was done going retrograde, the next one started like with Venus and then Mercury. And it just, and then now Mars is going to come up and Mars is retrograde is a very long one that only happens once every two and a half years. So it just so happens to be also a Mars year uh, in the sense of retrograde. So that's going to drag out. Mars is going to be in the same constellation until that he's in now until mid January, which is like a super long time. Usually he's maybe in a constellation for a couple months. And which constellation is he in? In Pisces. So about going with the flow, being more receptive, listening, all that same spiritual stuff we're talking about. Um, so yeah, that was very interesting. And then the fact, what you notice with the Pluto retrograde. So like I said, Pluto does go retrograde once a year, but what was so interesting about this year was that you had conjunctions with Pluto, which is, you know, when you're talking about outer planets like Saturn and Jupiter, these are quite rare events, you know, 20 to 40 years. So about 20 with Jupiter, you know, close to 40 with Saturn. So it's these very rare things that we have a series of these conjunctions with Pluto. And when Pluto then goes retrograde, it's going to emphasize that retrograde energy because it's having a more personal influence. Like the, the energies of Saturn and Jupiter, we feel more personally. So that's bringing down more Plutonic energy. And that's why we've seen a lot of that Pluto energy. And so when Pluto goes retrograde, we'll certainly recognize those, uh, that retrogradeness of it especially with Jupiter, because again, Jupiter expands and brings to the surface all that deep stuff about Pluto. So, you know, Jupiter has been conjunct uh, Pluto as well. So yeah, lots going on. The main message I think is, is really about, has been about obvious. I mean, this is again, hindsight now, but I think it's a trend that'll continue until at least mid-January. <clears throat> I mean, maybe, maybe once we get to November's, December's next events, but um, this theme of just having to kind of put on the brakes for a second, take a step back and just be as flexible and adaptive as possible. It's just really a year of doing that. That's fundamentally what retrogrades symbolize in the sense of what's really good to use them as, as time, period, time periods to be as flexible as possible, experiment, try new things, but not to get rooted into anything that we can't un unroot ourselves from because so much is changing during the retrogrades. Retrogrades symbolize going back and redoing and reexamining and things from the past coming back and all this. So it's you know very important for that. So yeah, definitely a retrograde year in the sense of the staggered energy, the conjunctions that are highlighting all of the separate individual retrogrades coinciding with this very long Mars transit of one constellation in Pisces who just so happens to go retrograde this year as well. I hadn't really thought about Mars being in Pisces this year and the retrograde there. This is actually super interesting because Mars is in a lot of ways connected to Pisces more than people would expect. I mean, it's not considered to be the ruler of Pisces, but Mars is the same root word as maritime. And martial law and maritime law are a lot more connected than people realize. Actually, the legal system that the West is using that's derived from uh, older Vatican constructs is considered to be maritime law or the law of the sea. And uh, so that's a whole thing to get into. Pisces represents the depth of the ocean as well. And the Vatican is represented by Pisces. They have the fish head hat on the Pope and there's a lot to that and it's too much to unpack in one conversation. But the the thing I want to get to is how we're seeing big currency inflation right now and big currency issues and 
questions of like, what's the next currency going to be? And what is current C, but the current C? It's the sea of energy that we are swimming in, in terms of how we exchange energy, what keeps us afloat. Uh, that's what the current sea does. The current is actually an electric word, but it's also a water word. And Mars being the martial maritime law ruler of things, uh, it's interesting that in its retrograde period, we're seeing the question of what the next current sea will be and whether that will be cryptocurrency or a lot of people are like, get you some gold right now. I mean, no matter what, that's going to be valuable. And I see the wisdom in that as well. But you have any thoughts about the Mars Pisces beyond what you've already said uh, in con context to what I've pulled out here? Or do would you rather hit us with anything else interesting that might be in the coming 2020 sky clock configuration while we're kind of moving towards the, the last 15 minutes or so? Yeah, I'd love to talk about the economic side of it, um, of the transits. Um, so Sagittarius, Jupiter deals with expansion, you know, again, hindsight, lots of inflation. And, and I would expect that to more than likely continue um, because Pluto is still in Sagittarius and Pluto will be in Sagittarius until I believe 23, 2020, uh, 23, maybe 24 around there for the next few years um, and then goes into Capricorn. So we've seen since Pluto, particularly since Pluto has entered into Sagittarius, which since just before the 2008 financial crisis, it's been some serious inflation, whether you want to call it QE or whatever the heck you want to call it, it's printing of money, right? And so that's been really ramping up since Pluto has been in Sag, and I would expect it to continue to ramp up till at least the next few years while he's finishing Sag. Where he goes next is he goes into um, Capricorn, which is when we're really going to see, I think, a lot of the restructuring. So Capricorn is Saturn's constellation. So where we have this like single event at the beginning of the year that's kind of you know dragged out in terms of restructuring systems. Um, this is a decade long process, uh, longer than a decade with Pluto in Capricorn. So it's the sequence of events where you do have a time period as Jupiterian, Sagittarius, economically, this is inflation. But as we always know, that always, you know, precedes um, some sort of restructuring of the system. Obviously, inflation can't go on forever. So I would expect in the timeline, the next few years, uh, that can, the printing, sustaining, seeming like it's working, everything's sort of normal. Um, but, uh, yeah, once Pluto gets into Capricorn, I would expect definitely some systems to start to be restructured and definitely that being the economic system, um, as well. And then the last time this happened, so when Pluto was in Sagittarius, last time this happened to where he's at now was the, uh, birth of the United States. So it was the revolutionary wars in, in the Americas. And just after, you know, that from that came actually a lot of inflation. Um, so like the continental do dollar, they were printing a bunch of it. They printed it into oblivion. Uh, and then the new system, the new economic system came out from that. So I would expect the same kind of repeating of events. Once Pluto goes into Capricorn, we'll really see a lot of the restructuring. Um, and then the, you mentioned cryptocurrencies. So, you know, Uranus, the planet of technology is going into the financial constellation of Taurus. So Taurus the bull represents money, finances, resources, and Uranus is technology and current, it's the electrical fields and all this. So uh, when Uranus goes into Taurus, it's usually symbolic of a technological innovation in resources and in finance. Obviously, we've already seen cryptocurrency emerge, but when Uranus actually enters Taurus, which will be uh, in about a couple years, few years, around the same time Pluto goes into Capricorn, um, that will be the uh, more than likely innovations financially. And I do have a strong feeling, not even feeling, but just strong knowing that it will be from cryptocurrencies because of the innovations that we're seeing today. Hopefully decentralized ones and not centralized ones. Hopefully it's not just the Federal Reserve's, uh, the, the, the banking elite creating a, a fake you know, decentralized blockchain technology, but a block that you're chained to because they have the ledger and they know every transaction you made perfectly. Right. Right. And they can just print that into oblivion as well. 
I have one other thing to throw in to your flow right here. Um, competing currencies were a big thing at the after the Revolutionary War, after that inflation and crash that you're talking about. Uh, st- for a while, their states had their own currencies and like seemed to be pretty healthy for things, actually, to have a bunch of competing currencies. And that's what we see with crypto right now. That's the environment of crypto right now. So I hope that that could be uh, a strong point for humanity's future, not a, our not our downfall into one block to be chained to as it were right and hopefully there's but honestly i don't think they can stop it at this point as long as people aren't afraid to use it because obviously they could always just make it illegal like you can't stop obviously bitcoin or especially now that there's these decentralized exchanges coming up even if they blocked all these gateways like where you can buy crypto like coinbase and stuff like this even if they blocked all those gateways, now that there's decentralized exchanges, it's like anybody with a computer can now, you know, get access to cryptocurrency. So it's pretty much over. My only, con- you know, in terms of the current financial system, my only concern is is that people aren't afraid to use it. So if they do make it illegal, or you know, whatever. Um, that people will still continue to use the free currency because the free currency is not going away. They would have to shut down the internet. And even that wouldn't totally stop it because there's still satellites that can process transactions. Um, There would have to be a complete cutting out of electricity, basically, would be the only way they could stop it, right? So, um, you know, as long as we have some functioning system of some kind, there's going to be crypto and it's there's always going to be the free, you know, crypto... um, you know, they're the the real decentralized crypto. And so I just hope that enough people will use it. And and I think it's it's just a given. I mean, it is the future uh, of finance. And um, I just hope there's not too much backlash from it. And people are facilitating the process of transitioning instead of being afraid and it just dragging out the process even longer, you know? That's a super good point. Myself, I'm guilty of uh, not diving into those waters as I could because there's a, somewhat of a learning curve to using crypto and getting involved with it. But I'm sure once you get going, you're going. One thing that I've found recently that, I mean, I'm not going to recommend this to you in a legal sense where I, it's advice, but just, I'm not adding vice to you. <laughs> but if you're interested in looking into this, it's something I'm probably going to try out. It's called wealthybot.io. That's the website. And wealthybot is basically as far as i know it's totally free to use and it's like a uh an a soft ai system that uses the secret sauce to make crypto trades for you on your behalf with however much money you give it and i i only have one personal endorsement from someone i know about it and i'm going to talk about it with that person more really soon cuz they'll be coming on the show but uh it's he said that in a month he turned he made fifty dollars off of five hundred. So that's a ten percent improvement in his investment in a month. Which, when you think about it, that's actually huge for being money that you make while you sleep. And people I know that are into crypto are saying it's about to run right now. It's about to get crazy. So I'm, one of the things I'm going to do today is try to figure out how to get some some money put into this wealthy bot thing. And as far as where it comes from. For anyone out there that's familiar with Seven Bomar of SecretEnergy.com, a teacher that I really, really dig and have gotten all kinds of useful tips out of over the years. He's the guy that created this thing. I mean, him and a team. So in my opinion, it's coming from a valuable, reputable source who's only ever, from what I can tell, tried to give people tools to their sovereignty and break the matrix however he can. So uh, definitely check out WealthyBot if you want a way to dip your toes into crypto without having to manage your portfolio and doing all these buying and tradings. And another thing about WealthyBot is you can put in simulated money and it'll just give you an email report from time to time of like, okay, if you would really put in a thousand dollars, here's how much you'd have right now. And that might be a good way to convince yourself whether or not you want to use it. I'm sure it's not perfect, but if my friend is really telling the truth and he made 50 bucks off 500 in a month, that's a lot. So um, I like what you said. It's up to us to facilitate the process of making this transition happen faster and um, be directed by us instead of directed by the elites. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For sure. And yeah, I'll definitely check that out. Wealthybot.io. Yeah, cool. And then that's where it's going to, I mean, eventually it's only going to become easier too, though. Like right now with any new technology, the barrier to entry is always so difficult. 
like if we were to compare it to like the internet, we're probably in like 94 or something. And like AOL is about to send us some CDs to make it a little bit easier. But even then, it's still kind of challenging, you know? We're on dial up of crypto right now. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's move towards the goalposts here, Ethan. It's been awesome talking to you. I really enjoy your insights on this. And it's funny because just as I was starting to like lean a little towards tropical for, for various reasons, now I'm like, okay, but this sidereal thing has got so much juice to it. And uh, you're a great teacher of these things. And I appreciate how thoughtful you are. And if you have any closing thoughts or any uh, other interesting 2020 sky clock stuff to point out to us before we wrap up, that would be awesome. And of course, don't forget to remind people where to find you uh, before the end of this. Yeah, I mean, I think we pretty much covered it. Um, yeah, the retrogrades, the eclipse, the conjunctions. I mean, the, even the larger time frame we looked at with Pluto and all that. Yeah, I mean, I think that was, uh, yeah, I think that pretty much sums it up. But yeah, it was a great conversation. Really good good to be here. So again, masteringthezodiac.com. Uh, there you'll find the YouTube videos. You'll also find some... Uh, of those dates if you want to see exactly where the plants were when you're born and see if it resonates just go into it with an open mind and um i'm fairly convinced that you'll find it uh very accurate in terms of describing not what's going to happen in your life not these predetermined things but how you can empower yourself and really embody your true self and and the whole point of astrology is not to tell you anything you don't already know it's just simply to confirm what you already know about yourself and then have that stronger sense of conviction and you know follow your your inner guidance, your life path, um, you know, more clearly and things like that. So yeah, masterthezodiac.com is where those resources are. But yeah, thanks again, Chance. It's been great. Awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Everyone go check out Master in the Zodiac and we'll catch you guys later. All right. Made it to the end of another episode. Thank you everybody for being here and checking out the podcast. If you're a plus member and notice that there's not a second hour, it's because Ethan didn't actually have time for that. But just consider this a bonus episode because I'm going to be putting out a full two-hour show about the same time that this one comes out, and it's really good. And if you're new to the show and you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go subscribe to Interverse Plus on Patreon and get access to the whole archive of two-hour or more episodes that are probably at this point well over 100 of them in there. And of course, in the second hour, things always get juicier. And I would have loved a second hour with Athen because he's so awesome, but we got through a lot of com- a lot of uh, content in this first hour. It was excellent. So it's a great bonus episode. Hooray. And very interesting year to be looking at the astrology for, for sure. I also found it interesting to look at this dynamic between tropical and natal charts, like not natal, tropical and sidereal charts, like we talked about a little bit in this episode. And um, I kind of think there's value in both systems. So. Just do what looks good to you, what feels good to you when you're getting into these things. Maybe check out both types of astrology for a while and see what resonates or if you think one type resonates more for some things, but the other type resonates more for other things. For example, I think the tropical system works really well for natal charts for whatever reason, but sidereal is really interesting on the year to year and on what's currently happening right now. So yeah, make it your own, guys. This is... uh, technically a type of pseudoscience anyway. It's really more about drawing out your intuition and recognizing the patterns that exist in nature that are also a part of you. So very fun, very fun indeed to be looking at all the different ways that the universe mirrors ourself back to us in an awesome, amazing fractal way. So um, you might have noticed something a little special at the beginning of the show if you've been listening for a while, and that was that we've got entirely new intro music thanks to a friend of mine who produces tunes and i guess this is like a little virtue signal moment but i happen to know a lot of people that make music and are at the level that you might consider an up-and-comer as far as their career goes doing really awesome very creative very good at what they do but there's no shows to play right now so i've always wanted original music for the podcast and i thought this is a great time to buy something from a person that actually tries to make a living or is making a living off their music and i'm very happy with the result so now we own our very own intro music i might still use the old song sometimes because i love it so much and it's definitely not going to go away but pretty awesome and i hope you guys like that i'm going to play the uh, whole song at the end of the show so stick around if you want to hear the full version and 
yeah make sure you also check out the show notes for links to athens website mastering the zodiac and athens youtube channel and some of the books and the wealthy bot thing that we talked about during that really interesting part about crypto and you know this is not an episode that has plus but i want to make a reminder about how plus works for you guys that do have it or that are curious about it you might be mistakenly thinking you have to stay on the patreon app or on the patreon web page to actually access the extended content but there is a way to get the rss feed into your podcast playing app just like you would with any other podcast so it updates in there with your other shows and you don't have to go somewhere else to get it and use the sometimes buggy patreon interface especially going through a phone so look into how to do that it's basically on the my membership page there's a link there and you can just copy and paste it as a new station into whatever podcast playing app you use and you'll be good to go and you'll be enjoying all the many many myriad of plus episodes that there are in the archive i know that a lot of you newer plus members can't have had time to go through all of those yet and i hope you're enjoying it and i really appreciate all the new members that we've got lately um Let's see, what else did I want to tell you guys about? Oh, so if you're not on Plus and you want to support the show in a different way, or you are on Plus and you want to support the show more, there's other things you can do that would be really appreciated and awesome. We have a merch shop on the website. Just go up to the shop link. There's not a lot in there right now, but you can get a t-shirt or an interverse poster or a poster of my original artwork if you're into that kind of thing. At least go check it out, see what you think, and uh, check back often because. I'm kind of crunched for time, but as I can find a few minutes here and there, I have been throwing new items up into the shop and I'll keep doing that. On the free side of things that you can do to support Interverse, you can go to the iTunes podcast app if you're an iPhone user and leave a five-star review. That's totally free. And from time to time, I like to go read the uh, reviews that are new in there on the outro, so you might hear your words. (laughs) Uh, You can also support the interverse tribe by jumping in the interverse discord which is going to be linked on the website and in the show notes here and you guys can talk to each other about your evolution and ascension process share your art i hop in there from time to time when i can it's starting to get pretty happening in there and everybody is really kind and really cool and has a lot of interesting information to link so think of it as like a treasure trove of knowledge and connection that you could never get to the bottom of and i hope to see you guys in there and you are in there and you want me to see something remember just tag me like you would on other social media and um yeah so get into the discord if that sounds cool you can also use the secret energy affiliate link that's in the uh show notes for this episode where if you go to the secret energy shop you can basically get interverse a which is me <laughs> just me by myself get me a nine percent i think commission on whatever you buy there and I haven't tried every product on their shop, but it's an amazing metaphysical store and metaphysical website full of free knowledge and lots of amazing supplements that you can use. A few of the things I've tried would be like the colon cleanse kit. I'm getting ready to, as soon as I can afford it, buy the heavy duty full internal cleansing kit. And I'm sure I'll talk to you guys about that when it happens. Um, the a really cool thing related to the Zodiac that you can find on there are called cell salts. And I don't claim to be an expert about what these things are, but it's a type of homeopathy where you, as I understand it, it's like a refined essence of different biological types of cells. And it, whenever you do this refining process, it gets it down to like this white powdery salt thing. It's not, it doesn't taste salty. It tastes slightly sweet, actually. They're pressed into these tiny little, um, really tiny little tablets and you let them dissolve in your mouth. And the idea is that these 12 salts form the base of what your body uses to fuel different processes in your body. And there are 12 different salts are related to the different signs of the Zodiac. And some people will tell you that uh, as a person that's got a certain sun sign or a prominent something, you know, you have to know your own astrology, but if there's some area where, you know, you use a lot of juice from one of the 12 houses of the Zodiac, you could get the salt that corresponds to that and kind of boost your output there. Like there's one for Aries, which is what I am called Cali Foss. And I take it to, uh, basically it's like a congestion type of relief that I get. A lot of head related issues kind of are aided by it. Uh, Allergies can be helped by it. Um, Of course, you got to know that it's going to work. You can't just take this and be like, this is bullshit. 
but it's really inexpensive. Yeah, the Cali Foss one is supposed to also help with, I, I think, thinking and mental clarity, which again relates to the head, which is what Aries symbolizes. But okay, I think I'm at the end of talking to you guys. <laughs> um, it's been fun. I'm going to enjoy playing this new Interverse exclusive song at the end of this episode and um, move on to producing and getting done with this other one that I'm going to release in just a day or two as well. And I hope to see you guys on the other side in the next episode. Amazing content already waiting to be published. I've got lots in the shoot and a lot more on the calendar coming up. So thanks for supporting the show. Thanks for listening. Love you all. And bye bye. <laughs>